intra theater, we see like IED, so improvised explosive devices. We see motor vehicle crashes, ATV rollover, aircraft crashes. At the point of injury, they would be picked up by army dust off or pararescue. Those patients would then go to their first level one or level two type of facility where they would have damage control surgery. They could be in a tent, they could be in a building of opportunity. Then we got to get them out of there because they're going to run out of resources and we move them to a larger facility with more capability. They'll take a CCAT team and augment that air medical evacuation crew, and so that provides an ICU level of care. And then it could be 48 to 72 hours before the patient's home. CCAT stands for Critical Care Air Transport Team, basically the flying ICU. So you have a doctor, a nurse, and a respiratory therapist. They work together as a CCAT team, and we augment those air medical evacuation crews. So the AE crews actually are our interface between the CCAT team and the aircraft. So they do all the electrical hookup, and they're the electrical and oxygen capability. So that ensures that we are able to fly on anything that they can fly on. So it's not a special plane that does just air medical evacuation. It is a cargo plane that just took everything and anything down and it gets turned around and turned into a hospital to bring our guys home. You might spend 10 minutes, 15 minutes taking off. You might spend 10, 15 minutes landing and these will be combat takeoff and landings. It could be within the theater itself, it could be out of the theater, or from Europe back to the United States. So C-17 and C-130 are a primary airframe, but in the PACAF mission in the Pacific, they also fly in the KC-135. Now once you get in the aircraft and take off, there's no help button. Typically they're flying anywhere from 15 to 30,000 feet in the air. It's dark, it's cold, or it's hot. There's noise, and there's low light. You have to communicate with the headset. A lot of the situational awareness can be lost by other distractors that are at hand. You've got everything you need. You've thought through all the backup plans and that you can take care of anything that could possibly happen. I've had missions where we had three patients, so if the aircraft is like this, there's two patients on one side, one patient on the other side of the aircraft, and then you have to split up the team so that there's one person looking at all the monitors at one time. A lot of the alarms and things that we would typically hear in the ICU don't happen, so you have to be very vigilant to keep eyes on the monitors and the different equipment. You don't carry a stethoscope in CCAT in an aircraft because you can't hear. The only thing important in your whole life at that moment is that patient. The nurse is the backbone of the team, the jack of all trades. We know how to mix the drugs, we know how to operate the equipment. I am an emergency medicine critical care physician. We also have anesthesiologists, cardiologists, trauma surgeons. But it's an expectation that everybody would be able to overlap with some of the responsibilities of the other members of your team. A nurse being comfortable with the vent or doing something that is out of their function or even the doctor for that matter going over and programming the pump or pushing the medication, doing something with the ventilator. And for the RT, it's the same thing, actually giving a medication or changing something on the IV pump. This is the ultimate team sport. The CCAT training is fairly extensive. The first phase of the training with the initial phase up at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base is a two-week course. We're not teaching you how to be a doc. We're not te teaching you how to be a nurse or a respiratory therapist. You should have that base knowledge coming into this course. We're teaching you how to take care of a patient in the back of an aircraft. We teach to all members of the team all at once. So we try to, to make sure that everyone's on the same page. The optimal goal is to have high fidelity simulations with high technology to provide adequate training to all of those individuals. You will run them through simulation, orient them to aircraft power, electric, seating, in-flight emergencies, crew resource management, and that's just on the aircraft. Outside the aircraft, you can go upstairs into our sim center where we have high fidelity sims going. We can run two, three sims at a time and really give that realistic aspect of being on an aircraft with noise, dim lights, really setting the student in the CCAT environment. 
Our mannequins play a huge role in our everyday training. We have some great sim operators uh, that really know what they're doing, that really provide the best simulation-like care that they can give. There are simulations that are targeted at picking up the patients on the ground. How do you package them appropriately, meaning how do you put the equipment on them in a timely manner and make it back to the aircraft in time? They actually use the real supplies and materials that they would use in the outside world when they were taking care of a real patient. And if someone forgets to hook up the oxygen on the ventilator, their saturations will drop, and if they don't figure it out, their patient could die, for example. The advanced course completed in Cincinnati, Ohio at the University of Cincinnati Medical Center is focused more on the medical care of the patient and the medical capabilities that the CCAT teams have at their disposal. We have been seeing in the last decade that when the war has been downtrending, that our military personnel, our physicians, aren't seeing the trauma that you see in a level one trauma center. Cincinnati was chosen as a partner uh, for the uh, CCAT and CSTARS programs, uh, in large part because we're a very busy civilian trauma center. You have to see a lot of patients. And for trauma in the civilian world, the penetrating rate, people getting stabbed or shot, is probably only around, it's going to be somewhere around 12, 15 percent of all the trauma patients. We serve as the uh, only adult level one trauma center for a uh, population of about 2.4 million people and see 4,200 trauma activations each year. And then not everyone is shot or stabbed needs an operation. So you got to see a lot of trauma in order for you to do enough cases. And that translates over to Afghanistan and you're better able to take care of those patients. It allows the validation cadre to see how they will prepare and perform in the environment itself. We want to put you through a scenario that is as close to real life and we want to stress you out because the more we stress you out here, the less stressed you are in a real life scenario. The training over the period of time, over that four weeks, adequately prepares somebody to take care of all of the critical injured patients throughout the world. We use the term validation. So if they do not validate, they are not allowed to go on the mission. That validation week is done to make sure that all of the providers, nurses, as well as respiratory therapists are proficient and competent for taking care of all of these patients and humanitarian missions that the CCAT teams will complete. It's the pattern recognition. That's what we're trying to get to, is to distill down all of this information to the point where you see a hemorrhagic shock patient that's had massive blood resuscitation, and I have one, two, three things I'm looking for and distill it down to make it easy to algorithmically take care of your patient. Back in Vietnam, it used to take uh, weeks for, for patients to, to get back overseas, but now we can have somebody home within 72 hours. Without being able to rapidly move people to a higher echelon of care, I think you would have uh, higher mortality rates. And right now we are sustaining a 98% survival rate. My last deployment, I was able to transport an individual from Afghanistan to Germany, stood two days in Germany, and then my team was up to be able to transport him back to stateside. Uh, in the end, when we were able to get him to stateside, to Bethesda, it was the most rewarding feeling for him to say thank you. During a CCAT mission, people like to say, you know, you're saving lives by taking these patients from this, you know, Afghanistan or Iraq or wherever back to the States, be with their loved ones, providing health care to save this person's life. For me, basically, I, how I see it is, I'm just doing my job. 